Hello and welcome everyone. After a brief technical difficulty, we are ready to start All Night Portland. Tonight's program is called Entering XR, Building a Metaverse with Intention, Community, and Meaning. We have some fantastic guests here today, but first, we're coming to you live from the Oregon Reality Lab. Uh, thank you, a special thank you to um, the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Dr. Donna Davis for hosting us here. Um, let's talk about All Night Portland. All Night Portland is one of 30 community events worldwide. All Nights are the local embodiment of the AWE spirit in communities across the world. We provide a safe space for designers, developers, creative agencies, futurists, analysts, and others to come together and talk and inspire others. We're here to advance the augmented reality industry in each city by connecting and empowering the community. Additionally, right now, all Night Portland members can get a discount of 20% off their AWE 2022 registration uh, with the code 22AWNIGHTSD. Super deluxe. Awesome. Kami Karras, can you tell the nice people here about Awesome Future? I would love nothing more than to tell the nice people here about Awesome Future. We are your hosts. We are Awesome Future. Awesome Future is an XR creative technology studio by Cami Karras, me, and Nathan C. Bowser. Metaverse strategy, marketing, and activations, we're here to build more awesome in your future. I'd also like to introduce you to our speaker, Donna Davis. I'm gonna wait for the slide to come up so y'all can follow along with me a little. Actually, I'm just gonna start. Donna Davis is an expert in virtual reality, VR, digital embodiment, tech equity and inclusion and digital social capital. At the University of Oregon in Portland, she is an associate professor and director of both the Oregon Reality Lab and the Strategic Communication Master's Program. Her ethnographic research focuses on the potential uses of social virtual worlds, gamification, and other emerging immersive media with a special interest in marginalized and vulnerable communities. Her research on embodied experience and identity among people with disabilities in virtual reality was funded through a grant from the National Science Foundation. And I'll just add this little thing. I've got a sneak peek of it and it's really cool. Donna, over to you. Um, it's such a treat to be here with you all in the OR lab tonight and uh, in Portland and there, Cami is, there she is by me. <laughs> And Nathan is on the other side, um, but I'm super happy to be here and to share um, my story with you and my work with you. So I want to start by um, talking a little bit about what I'm going to do in the next 15, 20 minutes, try and help us catch up a little bit. So um, my theme for this evening as I talk about this is who am I as we think about identity and our evolving digital selves? So I am Donna Davis and in, in this physical world, in this physical body, I am Trady Felicimo in a virtual world. I have multiple avatars in multiple platforms and each time I have to create that avatar, I have to really stop and think about who am I and how am I representing who I am in that digital body? So as we think about that, I want to start a little bit to give you a little bit more about me and my avatar is indeed 14 years old, which means in human years, that's about 84. We always say in dog years, the dogs are in human years. So I have a very old avatar. Um, some people would even say a legacy avatar. Um, I started in Second Life, which is now 19 years old. People all the time say, you mean it's even still around? And I always have to say yes. And not only is it still around, it's really experiencing a renaissance, especially with all the news about the metaverse in the last year. And Philip Rosedale, who created Linden Lab, that created Second Life, has um, seen a lot of press in the last year or so. So um, the, the, it's still a very vibrant and developed virtual social virtual world with a very active community and, and a community of creators as well. So as we think about identity in the virtual world, we have to start with why are you there? 
what is it that you want from that experience in that environment? So are you there to play? And as you think about gamers, gamers create avatars to play, whether that's creating an avatar to be in World of Warcraft and what side are you on and what role do you play? Um, or in, um, I, I mean, I'm going really dating myself now in EverQuest and all, my son was huge into EverQuest. And I always was like, what is that you're playing and what is that creature over there? So who do you want to be? What do you want to embody in? For what purpose? Is it to play a game? Um, it may be that you want to be there to connect with others. And when we think about the bodies that we use to connect with others, it's really fascinating if you look at the templates that are usually the options you have to choose from. If you're not a builder or a designer, you're always going to start with whatever the template is of the platform. And almost entirely, they are have traditionally been, you could choose the male or the female. You could choose this many white avatars and maybe one or two avatars of color. And then, um, and kind of that was it. You had to be a creator or a designer to go beyond potentially even human form. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. You know, and or, have you created a digital body for the purpose of work? As we think about the last two years, where most of us have existed on screens, it's so lovely to have human beings in the lab right now. And we actually do have students that come into the lab as well for classes. But um, to be on a, on a screen, do we want to be in these flat square boxes as our humans? Or do we really want to have the opportunity to recreate ourselves in really creative and maybe playful or maybe serious ways? And so many of the, the people that are creating those platforms now, there's been such a push to create um, avatars that look just like us. But so with that in mind, I want to think about tonight what we'll talk about is the future of work. And you think about digital identity in the future of work. And what does that mean? So you're going to meet all of my working avatars <laughs> and the trials and tribulations of creating that digital identity across multiple platforms. But um, as I do work in these environments as Dr. Donna Davis, which if you think about that, it's my initials are 3D. So my <laughs> avatar's name is Trey D um, for a reason. Um, so we're going to talk about our avatars for work. So as I mentioned just a second ago, um, there are a lot of platforms that are working towards holog holograms, you know, that holographic um, photorealistic avatar that really represents you. In the local chat, if you would just mention, um, how many of you think it's that we need to be just like us, or we need to be look and embody our human, regardless of what digital platform you're in? And people are going to be quiet in the chat. Um, feel free to to add as we go. But um, that has been a huge focus of the folks at Meta and the labs there at um, High Fidelity and um, so many other platforms are looking at how do I make a, an avatar that, to look just like me so we can be in a meeting together and sit around and know exactly who each other is. And I love all the nope, 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 notes and that it should be a choice. I'm going to agree with you and I'm going to use the example of my friend Cody who we took to Linden Lab. He's a, he was a 32-year-old man with cerebral palsy. Um, with severe disability with um it was almost impossible for you to even understand him when he when he spoke because his uh voice was trapped in the way his brain worked which was like his body which he was wheelchair bound his caregiver understood everything he said and she was like an interpreter for him and um we took him to linden lab and to high fidelity in san francisco to talk about what embodiment means to somebody like Cody. So as we think about Cody who um, cannot walk in the physical world, there's nothing he loves to do more than ride a motorcycle in the virtual world. And certainly his avatar body has the ability to do that in a virtual world where his physical body will not allow him to do that in the physical world. 
So, um, and what about the technologies themselves and the affordances of those technologies and how they create identity, uh, which is really important as well as we think about um, who we are and um, what our digital identities and those affordances do for us. So what I'm gonna do is switch screens and um, hopefully, okay. Now I'm gonna now go to my avatar and she's also waiting for us in the virtual lab. So as we go to the Oregon Reality Lab in the virtual world, meet Trady Felicimo. This is my avatar and I don't have any company in there right now. They're all here in the physical lab, but we've created it to look as close as we possibly could like the physical lab and um, stand up and give you a quick tour. And as we think about um, if you could see me right now in the physical world, you would see also that my um, avatar, my human's clothes are kind of just like my avatar's clothes. And as we think about, um, although her glasses are cooler than mine, she's younger than me and she's thinner than me. And it's really interesting because this thing I just clicked is my animation override so that I stand and walk in a natural way, which if I have off, it makes my body stand stiff and I can't move naturally and I walk strangely. Um, where if I turn on the AO, I then am gonna be way more cool. So AO on nature takes its, <laughs> it, it looks more natural. So, um, and it's fascinating because when I log in, if I'm in a classroom and I'm introducing people to Trady for the very first time, um, the giggles in the room of, oh, look, she's trying to look younger than her, or she's trying to look thinner than her, or whoa, look at those clothes, or whoa, look at that swagger. Yes, I have a swagger in the virtual world because I can. Um, and because it looks way more natural than not choosing the technology application that allows me to move like a natural human. So, um, and but people make assumptions about why I would have a younger, thinner avatar. I have tried to make it look more like me and then it looks really, really bad. So I go back to the template, which is a younger, thinner version of me. And um, I'm, and as I would have many people say, maybe it's the idealized me. And in working with a woman with Parkinson's who was 84 years old when she started a support group in Second Life, 84 years old, she could figure out the technology and her avatar was this very adorable young vibrant um she loved being in second life and swimming as a mermaid or putting on a ball gown and her son would log in from the other corner of the country and put on a tux and log in and take his mother ballroom dancing and as i sat beside her in her tiny apartment in southern california to watch her do this in, in the physical world, she pointed to the screen. It was like everything about her got stronger. And she said, that is the real me, not the me trapped inside this broken old body. So as we think about who we are, sometimes the spirit of who we are is trapped in what other people label us as in our bodily forms. So, and, and at the same time, we carry those labels with us into virtual worlds and into the metaverse. So I may still have a label here. Many of those labels would be that, you know, I am a female, I have gray hair. Um, so I match my human that way. So I let people know that I am a middle-aged person. And although, you know, it's pretty fashionable in young women these days too, is to have my color hair. So they're trying to keep up, um, but you know, who are we? What are we trying to convey and in what way? So um, I'm going to take us out of the lab because, of course, once we're in the virtual world, I always leave the lab and say, OK, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. Now we have elephants outside. We have I, and of course, I can fly here, which is something I haven't figured out quite how to do flying and teleportation. They just don't work yet. 
I'm walking into a build that was created by a woman who is blind. So as we think even about who we are, think about, uh, and one of the most humiliating moments in my, in my life, I was traveling to a conference with a woman who runs an organization in this or in Second Life called Virtual Ability. And I said, gentle, I, I, you know, it's amazing that, that the woman that built this wants to be in Second Life, but it's such a visual medium. So what is the attraction for people who are blind? And her response to me was so painful. It was like being, not being pregnant, somebody asking me when I was due is a humiliating question. I was asking a very humiliating question. I was humiliated because she said, Donna, people are blind in the physical world. Does it mean they don't belong there? Of course they belong. So of course she belongs here and she created this and I don't have time to show you now, but happy to connect with you at any time and walk you through this if you'd like. But um, it's guided by sound. So if I had the sound on, you would be able to hear how to get through this um, place by sound. Um, and it also has a note card giver that tells you all about the woman who was in Hawaii that um, built this with one of the other people from our community. So as we start thinking about our avatars, um, I want to show you Trady and anybody want to guess what um, platform this avatar is from? Because you do, you can do, you can experience this platform either in VR in a in a headset or on a screen in 2D. And because I'm there, you go. Caitlin knows this is Alt Space VR. This is my avatar in all space. Thank you, Caitlin. I knew you could answer that one. <laughs> the, um, and I made this avatar when my hair was blue. So, um, and her hair is way curlier than my Second Life avatar, which is really more authentic. Um, and yet my options for attire were, are in pretty incredibly limited. One of the other things about this platform that's super interesting that creates, I, I'm working right now in stereotypes. And what kind of stereotypes are created in a virtual world? Or what stereotypes do we carry with us into virtual worlds? And there's a stereotype with this image that I found to also be really complicated and sometimes very frustrating because I'm one of those people that gets um, motion sick in a headset like that. So I am one of those people that often has to be, if I'm going to be in alt space, I'm not in a headset. The, the new headsets are much better and I can be in them longer, but a lot of times I'm going to be on the screen. And if I'm on the screen I'm not in, and I'm not in a headset, I'm also not holding hand controllers, so I have no arms. And when you go into a, a crowded place, like around the fire in one of the public places, people know you don't have on a headset or hand controllers. And it's almost like a classism or an elitism, like why aren't you in a headset? So um, I have found that to be a really interesting response. I have all my other surprise avatars lined up here that I'm gonna go to the next platform. And this would be my avatar. Oh my Lord. Um, I have such a hard time with these avatars. These are my avatars. Anybody want to guess what the platform is? <laughs> Caitlin knows. <laughs> Imagine that. Yes, this is Verbella. And these, um, it's really interesting. I, I still struggle. I was recently at an event in Verbella and I chose this avatar because um, it's got big hair. I have big hair. Um, the, um, but it doesn't have, I mean, I could go with gray hair and I could put my hair up, which I do often, but now I look kind of in a young body with an ancient head. Um, who am I? Who am, I have a real identity crisis in Verbella and it's simply because it's where the platform is in its evolution. So they're getting better. They're going to continue to get better, just like um, um, 
alt space will. But again, there's this common theme as well that if you're in Verbella, you're in alt space or the next one that I'm going to show you, um, there is a real common theme. So I often think about these avatars um, and remember um, the early days of virtual worlds. So let me give you my next one. And OK, what platform am I in? And Rachel had a question about a frame. Nope, not hubs. I will, I do have hands, I have hands. I was in a headset, I had hand controllers, and I had to be. This was an interview that I did last month in, um, thank you, Rachel, it is Horizon Workrooms, and this was part of an interview that I did with the, um, global, the VP of Global Community for um, Meta Horizon, or for Meta. And they, we were having a discussion about building community in the metaverse. So this avatar, of course, all of these are my work avatars. What do I want to look like as Dr. Donna Davis? So at least I have curlier hair. I am not as gray as I would be in Verbella. Um, and I was in this interview is available on it's I've got it posted all over the place so you can watch the interview. It's about 30 minutes talking with DJ Soto who started VR Church and all of these platforms that I've talked about today and um, has people come from all around the world to church <laughs> in in VR. So and what it takes to build community in these spaces was the the um, topic of that interview. So I want to finish um, what I'm going to talk about with um, an angle here. So you can see both my very professional self and I want to show you my original Second Life avatar. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I can hear guests in the background. Yes, this is my original avatar. So this was in 2008 when I was a PhD student at the University of Florida and we created an event complete with PowerPoint slides behind me in the, um, in the virtual world. And I chose this hair and it's really interesting because Philip Rosedale's original avatar has almost identical hair. So I felt suddenly proud, um, but I chose this because there was a lot of baggage that came with Second Life in 2008 and 9, and I wanted to make it abundantly clear that I wasn't trying to look sexy. So as we think about who are we, what are we trying to be, who are we trying to, what are we trying to convey? And um, this was the avatar that to me was, I'm in a virtual world, I can look like and be like anything I want to be. And where I could do a couple of really quick clicks and be a fairy or a dragon, all of which I have in my inventory of 14 years. But we have a lot more to learn tonight, and I'm really excited to hear it, Caitlin. So um, I, but this is just to give you an example as we think about the affordances of virtual worlds and we think about um, the metaverse as it comes who are we? What is our identity? Why are we there? And what are the limitations? Why should I have to have hands? Why should I have to even have hair? Why should I even have to be in human form? And where if we had more time, I would take you next door to Daisy the Gator's Swamp, who is a wheelchair bound dwarf in the UK, who created her template, beautiful, tall, thin female avatar, because that was her option. And she didn't feel like herself. So she made her avatar really small, went back to her friends who laughed at her and said, you look ridiculous. Why would you do that to herself? And they were making fun of her as she is has always been made fun of in the physical world as a dwarf. So she created a gator avatar that's a little tiny alligator that she's learned how to put clothes on. And she is Daisy the gator. And she said, 
nobody's gonna and, and she went back to the same friends and they said oh my gosh you're adorable they would accept her as a gator a tiny alligator but not as a small human what does that say about us and our biases and what does that say about our expectations of our identities and each other as we enter the metaverse and with that i'm going to stop talking and stop sharing my screen so that we can hear from caitlin I feel like I should just be clapping here. This is amazing. Yeah. And Donna, thank you so much, Donna. Yeah. Please. I mean, as you were speaking, I was enjoying everything. And I kept looking at the glowing blue crystals in the corners, like they're Excalibur. I want to pull one out. You know, it's the environments are really beautiful. So thank you. Wow. Um, Nathan, I'll, I'll hand it over to you because I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you first so that you can get right in. Uh, Donna, thank you so much. We'll bring you back for question time in just a moment. Uh, fantastic. I'm going to, whoop, I need to share my, the program. All right. Whoop. Let's meet Caitlin Krause. Caitlin Krause focuses on the intersection of technology, innovation, and well-being, and founded the XR design studio and consultancy, MindWise, in 2015. That's when I first started getting interested in this stuff. <laughs> She's been doing it for a while. Uh, with the mission to empowerful, meaningful human connection. Let me say that again. She founded the XR Design Studio and Consultancy MindWise in 2015 with the mission to empower meaningful human connection. She teaches about XR and digital well-being at Stanford University, is a senior strategist at the Virtual World Society, and is a creative producer for Science VR. She's authored the books Designing Wonder, Leading Transformative Experiences in VR, and Mindful by Design. I think I may have cut that title off. Uh, with that, uh, we are going to hand uh, the conversation over to Caitlin Krauss of MindWise. Thank you so much for joining us, Caitlin. Take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Nathan. And it's so great to be here to see everybody and uh, be in community. I found myself just really riffing off everything that Donna was sharing. And I can't wait for us to share together and have this community discussion after I share a few things about wonder and awe, flow camp, all the things that I've been doing that really add to this conversation about intention, community, and meaning. So these are these are words that ring true for me. And as I have, uh, I can see a lot of friends here in the community tonight. As you have thoughts and you're putting them into the chat, um, just know I'll be uh, toggling back and forth and reading that and taking part in a lot of different um, ways to exchange with you tonight. So let's see. I wanted to show a bunch of different things. So I think I'm just gonna jump into Flow Camp because there's a way to really um, view what I'm developing right now as ways to enter a state of flow. So I became attracted to that word flow about I don't know, two decades ago, this idea of being in a creative zone. A lot of the work I do is with um, creativity and expression, so ways to share our stories in a meaningful way. And I found myself really encountering some of the friction of not just this time period, but you know, universally with technology, how do we get past um, both limiting beliefs and also things that are um, present in our society. I mean, it's just a really difficult time. So I found myself wanting to meet that moment for leaders and for people who are creatives who want to you know, really come alive in the metaverse. So I guess I would pause there in this moment and just ask you, what makes you come alive? Like what makes you feel like your wellspring is replenished? And uh, that's the world that I like to thrive in and explore and build together. So um, MindWise Flow Camp is something that, you know, as Nathan was saying, I've had uh, MindWise since 2015. I've continued to develop all of these programs in the metaverse. And then now it seems like a really rich time for people to come together and practice some collaborative exercises, you know, really transcend those limits and find themselves expressing more with well-being 
and agency and flow. So flow camp is a space where people can connect emotionally and, you know, really build that emotional intelligence and build that fluency. A lot of people understand now, you know, it's the beginning stage of understanding what the metaverse is. And then it's like, okay, well, how can we get involved in a way that really um, meets our intention and allows us to ground and feel like we have a better sense of presence. So that's my background. I've, been designing a lot of different um, community engagement events and then now i'm starting even deeper programming where people have a chance to skill build and also be together in community so i'll show you a few examples of what that looks like and then we can dive into some questions and some exchanges about um, how flow camp is developing and how maybe you could jump in and get involved if it piques your interest um, so two years ago I had been researching elements of wonder and awe and how our brain gets into states of creative wonder and ideation and innovation. And when my book came out, it was the middle of the pandemic, so I couldn't have a physical book launch. And it was perfect because it's about virtual worlds. So we ended up having a book launch. I'll play the game. Where do you think this, uh, this book launch was taking place? Um, which social platform, if you want to take a guess, you could put it in the chat and I'll follow along. And I love, oh, thank you, Roxanne. Yeah, there's a lot of transcending. Close. Yeah, so this this was actually a, a world that was in alt space. And yeah, we were surrounded um, really by this this beautiful landscape people are standing on book spines and it gave the community around the world a chance to ask questions get involved you know and, and a chance for me to see people and connect in a different way than i would have in a in a physical setting so you know for me form fits function oops and a lot of the worlds that i build um look at look at really breaking past any kind of limits, whether it's an accessibility limit or whether it's somebody um, feeling as if they've attached to one single story. So I found it interesting as, as Donna was sharing about avatars and connection. Um, you know, I, I really echo those beliefs and sometimes um, we can reinforce stereotypes unwittingly by um, feeling typecast or feeling like we're, we're judged in a certain way. So uh, my background in mindfulness really brought me to um, create worlds with what I call the three A's of awareness, you know, building that awareness of inside out connection, and then a sense of agency, which allows us to stretch and grow and really feel like we're present. And then the third part is authenticity. Like what does it mean to really source our identity and you know, our, our creative soul and then allow that to be seen by other people, which takes a relational trust. So, you know, in leadership principles, this has big impact. This is an example of a really accessible space. I'll be opening one of these spaces up tonight for us to have some fun in. Um, I've also built worlds that are in places like this. This is a platform called Engage, and I built a social experience all um, based on emotion and um, the aurora borealis, the darkness and light of winter time and solstice, and had a group from all around the world practicing these exercises together in collaboration. And some people here tonight were part of that experience, which just, you know, gives me goosebumps thinking about how we've been together in a physical space. Um, and now there are more spaces that I'm building as part of this map that is all integrated with FlowCamp so that people can come in, have exercises, have me as a guide, and have that access to ways to feel a greater sense of freedom. Because I think ultimately we all wanna feel um, both freedom and uh, this grounding in this time where well being is needed. So, you know, chances to really stretch beyond what we could imagine and have experiences of wonder and awe together. So that's part of why I love social metaverse because it's it's shared, it's spatialized, and I've been adding in the additional S's of having storied experiences where we can share stories, having something that is, you know, really visceral, so I call that sensory, and then the last S that I use in the metaverse is soulful, 
Like, what does it mean to really imbue a sense of self in those spaces? So um, I'm going to also stop sharing for a moment and talk about flow for a second, because I've talked a lot about this idea of coming to really show up as our authentic selves. And some people ask me, well, what does that mean to access your creativity and feel like you're in a state of wonder? So in a lot of the research I've been doing through work at Stanford, through applications of neuroscience research, it's all bringing me back to that idea of being in the zone, being in a state of flow. Um, and as I research more and more about flow states, it's fascinating because it seems like virtual worlds, metaverse worlds, they're really provocative and, and ripe for coupling with flow states. So I'm just going to share a quick bit about flow before we talk together. So again, we've, we've talked about the problem. You know, clearly we live in states of disconnection. There are problems that exist in the world. It might feel like this. And inside my body, I want to feel like there's an expansive lake around me. In fact, people who know me well know that one of my hobbies is kayaking. I just love kayaks and being out on lakes and feeling that sense of delight and play. So I quickly lose myself in um, places and spaces where there's immersive nature. Now I get to apply that to metaverse and um, looking at that sense of freedom and flow, it really is a chance to have better connection, a lot of flourishing. So for me, I, I have all these reasons underneath wanting to bring people together in spaces that give them freedom. And then that led me to a researcher who just passed away last year. His name is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And maybe you've heard of him. Maybe his name is hard to pronounce. Um, he is known as the grandfather of flow states. He was at University of Chicago for many years and studied um, the science of flow. And he was really describing what it means to be in the zone and isolated in his findings eight characteristics. I've been taking a lot of that research and thinking about the metaverse and recognizing that flow and metaverse, we can, we can use VR, AR, and XR. I do feel like they all contribute to this sense of um, complete focus, a loss of sense of time. If I look at all of these attributes, you know, really having those experiences that, that give us a sense of agency and also ease. So it's known as a challenge skills balance. And um, for me, those, those aspects of flow with the programming I design really is, you know, based on that mission Nathan pointed out at the beginning to empower that human connection and to increase leadership capacity, you know, people's skill sets, and to do this in community. Like some people want to skill build and they'll go off on their own for a while and then feel like they need to come back. And um, my big question is how can we do this together through wonder, through awe, through play? Um, one of my inspirations is Seymour Papert and he was at the MIT Media Lab and had these, um, these four Ps that are part of design, projects, passion, peers, and play. And so when I think about great experiences and why we need to build metaverse fluency right now i'm thinking well how can we make it playful how can we bring in our passion you know and really involve peers with us so that we um we have these uh modules where people can practice and feel like they have a fluency building that's beyond thinking about devices and headsets or not i mean form fits function and ideally this tech rich landscape will keep evolving and we keep evolving with our skills in the midst. So right now it's uh, marking an exciting time where I'm starting to launch more programming that's um, groups of cohorts who want to share in metaverse fluency and do these practices together. So if you're interested in hearing more and diving in and having flow state exercises that really build skills, um, there's a chance tonight to get a taste of a world that's a web browser accessible and then there are also different parts of the flow camp metaverse where you can be part of a program that's deeper, more enriching. Um, so I'm looking at a cohort over this summer and I'm gonna give a link in case you're interested, we can talk 
more deeply about what that involves and um, how you can have access to those deeper experiences with my training and guidance. So I'm really excited about all of this. And um, again, that intention, community, and meaning, those themes tonight, uh, I think that's like the crux of what excites me uh, about the future of the metaverse. It does involve a lot of human connection at the heart. So uh, right now, what I'll do is I will put in the chat um, a link because what I want to do is just give people a chance. I know we have a lot of links to share. Um, there's a chance if you want to get a preview and a conversation with me about FlowCamp, I can put that into the chat right now. And then we can talk more deeply about that because it's going to be an exciting cohort of people who really want to get in there and share in a social environment. Um, and there's also Designing Wonder, the book that I wrote, if you just want to check out some of the design resources and the research about wonder and awe. And um, let's see, what else, Nathan? We can talk in community here before we dive into the experiential metaverse that's the web platform. I am so honored. To be here. There's a lot. Um, yeah, so that, that forum is there. And I think we check out the chat. You've got several people, Caitlin, saying, sign me up. Uh, so we'll make sure to get in touch with Lindsay and Andrea uh, as a follow up. Yeah. Uh, you had teased uh, some of that moon garden imagery. Is this a good time to kind of talk about uh, the kinds of uh, flow work you do in the, while we take a look uh, at the moon garden? uh where we'll be inviting folks uh to join us at, in sort of the after party uh but for now um we'll just kind of give you a peek we could definitely um, do that um also if you wanted to i know you had access to the book link if you wanted to put designing wonder into the chat that would be great because i'm already i'm in the moon garden right now so i can host it and, and kind of show people um as yep. you share screen but yeah that's perfect uh so uh i will if you can uh pause your screen share i will grab mine fantastic One more kayak <laughs> stop sharing there we go that should be for you now um awesome Uh, so I sent Nathan, in case in case you want um, a link, I love to share. I think he's going to drop in the chat a link to Designing Wonder just for this group, like the PDX group. In the, in the chat, uh, we've got a link both to uh, your form and uh, Lindsay dropped us a, a link to the uh, Designing Wonder. Awesome. And then now, if we want to play in the metaverse, this is this is your choice. I want to actually drop the link to the Moon Garden because if you want to join us in here, then I'm going to talk through what's happening. This is this is an experiment in live time. Join Nathan and me in Moon Garden. So oh my goodness, you know this is this is last time we're 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 just putting it out there. Thank you. Um, so a little background. Uh, I have a passion for Frankenstein as well as Mary Shelley as the author. And so uh, this is a um, an avatar that was built for me based on Mary Shelley. So I'm personifying her tonight and greeting you here. And as people are dropping in, just know that I can toggle back and forth from Moon Garden to here and you'll kind of see me in the moon garden, I can see Nathan in front of me running the camera. I feel, I feel like when I'm in this world, I just drop into my like loss of self-consciousness. And um, I've been hosting drop-in small meditations where people can come into this moon garden landscape for just 20, 25 minutes and um, have a simple meditation voice led by me. Um, again, browser-based you know, come as you are. I see people dropping in. We have seven people in the space right now, and I'm gonna lead you, if you'd like to, 
you can click, if you're following along on your browser, you can click on the number seven for the people here with the icons. You can click on that little pen by your name and where you see the pen by your name, you can choose to change your name. You can also uh, change your avatar to any choice from the number of fun avatars that are in the space. And, you know, thinking about what, what Donna had shared, these avatars are, you know, this is a Mozilla Hubs based environment. It's a very simple landscape. So um, the goal in here is actually not to um, mirror any part of your physical body, but it's really just to drop in, feel a sense of embodiment in a shared social space and have a chance to, um, as I welcome, Lesser Scayup and Cape Shoveler and all of these names coming in, you know, just feel free to have a sense of curiosity and delight. Like you might want to look around at the falling little pieces of snow. Sometimes I imagine them as petals off of the trees. I just start to experience a slowing down of my thoughts that tend to, you know, sometimes we go from point to point and we feel like we're just neck up and we're rushing. And this is a chance to slow down, to be in community together, maybe just to take a deep inhale through the nose and feel that turn of the breath and then exhale wherever you are, just, just explore what it feels like to invite a greater sense of ease into this moment as we exist in this moon garden together. You can look down at the grass. I feel like we're and neck up and then we're rushing. And then this is a chance to slow down to be in community, community together. Maybe so we just take a deep inhale. Raja Sheldak has said, I know the left turn of the brain and exhale. Wherever you are, just explore what it feels like to invite a greater sense of ease. So I'm laughing because. Um, People have the option here. It's complete freedom. You can unmute yourself at will. So if you decide to unmute yourself, you know, you, and you can see me, it's like that's the levity of the moment because this community is really um, cooperative. So as you come in, yes, there's that mute button where if we were only in that world and we were not live streaming, we could all mute and unmute. We could share. There's a little chat at the bottom where you can say hello. So it's another example of a very open source community where we're building um, a social experiment based on community trust, inspiration together. So um, I, I love it because it gives us a chance to see how you can scale up from there to different levels of complexity and agency. This is one of the simplest metaverses and there are ways you know, that I have in programming and Nathan's experienced it this morning. You can come in in a headset and have a, a deeper level of visceral interaction. Um, but how cool is it just looking around and seeing people moving around and having moments of um, embodied wonder and awe I've had feedback from people saying that they can be very serious in the middle of their workday, and then they take a break and come into the moon garden and feel a sense of spaciousness and, you know, like, like they have a little more capacity. So um, if you're experiencing this and you feel like you want to leave a little note for me, you can click on the book that says flow camp in the corner and just leave a few words that show um, your experience if you had any moment of wonder and flow and delight in the space. Um, and I, I host poetry readings and meetups here and all kinds of uh, creative events. So there are more chances to experience this type of flow together as well. So I'll pause there so we can we can talk together. Um, you know, this is this is something that I like to show as, as an invitation because it's not it's more formative. You know, rather than rather than everything of a, a bigger workshop, you know, you could come in even in a busy day and have time in flow camp. So and Nathan, you're you're muted and I know that's because you were in the world and you want to mute yourself. <laughs> but yeah, people can stay playing around with flow camp for sure. So we're gonna um we we got a little creative with our programming, so you're totally welcome to stay in Flow Camp. We do encourage folks to stick around in 
the AWE night broadcast because we are going to uh, move into a little bit of panel chat and questions. We've got some uh, X, oh goodness, the PDX effect uh, to check in on. And then uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, hanging out in the moon garden afterward uh, where we'll uh, leave the AWE program behind and just go have a moment uh, just in one screen. Uh, that may give us a, a little bit more opportunity to, uh, to be present there. Um, I actually might come sit next to Dr. Donna Davis uh, so we can um, simplify some of the mic uh, complications that we have from being in the same space. Um, but if you do have questions, if there are any questions in the audience, uh, do start uh, to put them in the chat and we will um, get that going. I see Cami in the background there too. So, hi. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> What's up? I'm going back and forth between FlowCamp and here and also looking at the chat and there's a little latency in the chat so I get to see myself like um, 10 seconds earlier and replay so it's funny as I'm looking down I'm, I'm typing into the garden. Uh, do you have any questions for us in community here so that when we talk together we're taking in um, questions from the chat? It would be great to hear. Can you hear me? Can you hear us now? Uh-oh. Hmm. I can hear you, Donna. <laughs> OK. Oh, OK, OK. It could be that the moon garden is OK. OK. I think I was muted in moon camp. Let me make sure. I'm muted there. So. OK. <laughs> Special thanks to our technical director. <laughs> <laughs> And feel free to wheel around the chair behind you. Oh, you know, that's the technology. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Going analog. <laughs> it's great. So today we were, uh, we're really diving into this idea of agency, um, the affordances that representation uh, gives us, and then the kinds of different powers that both spaces and avatars can give us beyond that. Was there anything that you heard in the others conversation that really uh, sparked your brain or um, felt really felt like a connection to the work that you do? Definitely. Um, and I'm and there was I meant if I'd had notes, if I could have taken notes, that my brain is like if it was a minute ago, it's gone. Yeah. Um, but the um, that idea of flow has been so embedded in the game spaces for so long. And I know when I'm building in, when I'm building, I am totally in flow. And it's when people ask me what my hobbies are, sometimes I go, golly, all I do is work. And then I think, <laughs> but the work I do is play, <laughs> you know, and that what I love just about more than anything is to create spaces or to create, you know, the look of an avatar um, and shopping there is so much cheaper than if I were to go <laughs> and try to do it out here. So um, I don't get in as much trouble. But I think that um, I love what you're saying in terms of even as you presented in alt space and to be in a group of people, because this is where also that sense of community and building community that was I my original research was studying social capital. Like, can you actually have social capital with another human if you only know them in digital form? Mm -hmm. And um, my research found overwhelmingly, yes, of course. And, um, and at the same time, I'd be presenting this work anywhere in the world. And I actually literally had someone stand up at me one time and yell at me how stupid it was because they're not even real. 
<laughs> so know, you go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't even use that real versus not real because I feel if the brain believes it to be real and, and um, you know, Roxanne in the chat had a point about the headset versus the browser. And I would say, um, well, first off, it's like the best the best camera you have is the one in your hand. And so sometimes I think having access to XR using a browser, you can still drop into a complete state of presence. Like as I was with Nathan just now in that 3D world, I felt like I was there because my attention is there. Um, so for me, I'll use I'll use words words like physical reality right. or the virtual worlds are the reality. Um, and you know, from states of the mind and attention states, it's really hard for us to place our attention in multiple places at once. You know, I'd argue that aside from maybe some levels of uh, senses that are hard to detect, we're really focused on um, one point at a time. And I think that that quality of attention is something to be practiced in order to access that beautiful state of flow. So as, as Donna is saying, oh, you know, you get into it in your work, I think a lot of people are struggling saying, well, how do I access that? Or, or how do I be in an XR world and feel capable with the tools and also have all of this access to collaboration examples and ways to not just translate what we're doing in the physical world into XR, but to see how XR offers um, different ways of communicating and different ways of being. So that's what I like to foster and train because I think people right now are hungry for that fluency, um, but they don't know how, what the inroads are and it can be really intimidating. So, so you know, to, to answer Roxanne's question again, like if people have access to headsets, even better, like there are different layers. Um, and my goal is to kind of guide across that bridge and um, do it in a way that's invitation over prescription so that people don't have a sense of fear in the in the midst of it. I would also add to that that um, the first time I went surfing in the virtual world on a screen, I mean, literally, I'm in my chair doing this, trying not to fall <laughs> off, the, you know, you're 100% present, yeah. even though it's a screen. And um, the, but absolutely the point you make about when you put on a headset and you've got your ears and your eyes basically um, completely hijacked, yeah, that is what takes over. So it's, I've had students in the lab that as soon as they take off the headset will go, whoa, <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm in this world. I, I thought I was there. So it is much more powerful and an and in this moment where um, our attention spans are about this, that and multitasking has become the norm. It's almost like teaching people how not to multitask again. Yeah, that, that was exactly my experience this morning with Caitlin. Uh, having the headset on them gave me the permission to just kind of sit down for a second and to be present with the content. And I could set my phone down. I'm a notorious multitasker. I could set my phone down because I couldn't see it, right? And there's that there's that like basic psychology of like the candy in the drawer is harder to eat than the candy in the bowl on the table. And just having a little bit of blinders on really let me get into the space. And I was in a cave with Caitlin and I felt the height of it and it was a very uh it was it was a fantastic experience to like kind of feel like i needed to stoop down or be a little quieter uh in that cave um so i've i've totally had presence on 2d screens and you know that mario kart phenomenon uh mm -hmm. that you talked about but oh my gosh uh just the focus was so pleasant so so pleasant Watching people on the plank, if you watch videos of people that have a headset on and are on the plank and they're, I mean, it, I have had students who's ha, who have turned away because it looks so real on the big screen. They couldn't imagine putting it in a headset, which goes to Roxanne's point of being physically safe, even yeah. that, you know, it's emotionally safe and physically safe that um, there's so much controversy around physical safety in a virtual world because we know that 
people have been um, virtually assaulted and it, and griefers are a huge problem. So, um, you know, what are the, and this is, I think, something that all of the platforms are grappling with right now is how do we create safe places in, in an age of trolls? And I think as we, as we advise people on both the, the metaverse development and all of the, you know, all the qualities that we would want to have in a collaborative environment, I feel really strongly like it's important to have those conversations with consideration and to step into really dreaming about how, um, how the emotional resonance is very deep in virtual worlds. And as people are invited to experience that, like today when I said to Nathan, well, come in and feel it for yourself, you know, feel that resonance. Um, I think we've spoken before, uh, Howard Rheingold is a, a friend of mine in cooperation literacy. It's like, this is the time that people have to feel both invited to create environments that they would want to thrive in. And also, um, you know, that that sense of, of real, um, there's possibility right now to, to shape something that is the world we want to build um, in a way that has all of our foundational human values. And I can't say it enough because um, if it ends up being um, more of a feeling of social distrust and more of a feeling of the rules of what not to do, um, you know, there's a space for that. I also love to invite leaders to say like, okay, these are places that I want my teams to be in. These are spaces that, you know, I want to learn and thrive in because, you know, that that then teaches us to kind of stretch beyond um, what's reductive. So, yeah, what you bring up is is super important and close to my heart. Ditto. <laughs> Everything you're talking about, it's so um, intertwined. I think the intersections are pretty amazing. Um, mm -hmm. And that's you know the um, ability to take that leap, as you said a minute ago, that you don't talk about it as virtual or real. Um, and Tom, I worked with Tom Bellstorp on this NSF grant with the disability communities, and we've always always said it's virtual and physical, but they're all real. So it's just like working with students who talk about when I'm done with school and go to the real world. You know, it's, we think about how we throw the world real out a lot, um, that all of it is real. It's just yeah. a matter of where it is that you're functioning. I'd also love to touch on Lindsay's comment about making space and place for meditation. I find that um, in a way that's really beautiful, some of the development of say flow experiences that i've been building in metaverse they can be like an open eye meditation um or closed eye you know people who feel comfortable and safe then they have that that base um and i've heard you know i think it's true right now we need rituals we need new rhythms for how we approach our day um, more companies are giving people uh, the ability to work from home and then people can feel like, oh, well, that's interesting. Now I, I don't really have boundaries in the same way I used to have. So <laughs> how can we how can we invite this to to be a design consideration in metaverse? You can have, you know, a certain part of your day where you have that garden space, that space for a meditation or space for a community time together. And then you go back refreshed and you're in your physical world. Um, you know, people might expect me to say that my goal is to disappear into the metaverse and not come back to physical reality. And I, I love to, I love to be in virtual reality, augmented reality. And, you know, it actually, it, it tends to sort of sand away all the rough edges and make my senses even more in tune. So when I'm in my physical environment, I can appreciate a lot. So um, I think meditation has a huge power in the metaverse to be part of these experiences and baked into them and not just the, um, the few minutes in the morning when we wake up or the few minutes before we go to sleep, which is when some people say they have time to connect with themselves. Um, I would like to point out also, this is a rainbow maker making all of these moving lights behind me because <laughs> I, I thrive with a little bit of movement and a little bit of wonder and delight in, 
and it's just funny like right now the sun happens to be at the at the right angle which i consider <laughs> a statement about this community all night portland is is bringing on the rainbows yes 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 yeah to that point too i just want to um i think one of the things that we've heard often is that in a virtual world because you're not looking at that person and you're not interrupted by and distracted by all of the things that distract us all of the time, that in having a conversation with somebody that you aren't necessarily, um, it, it's not that face-to-face, -face, but you're having a face-to-face -face conversation and they say you get to know each other from the inside out oh, yeah. because you haven't started with first impressions, which are so often visual. And we give people permission to define themselves in a way that we just don't give ourselves the same permission in this space. I totally agree. We could be also shoulder to shoulder sharing an experience where it's like the focus is not necessarily the eye gaze, but maybe, you know, imbuing an object with a story or, or doing something together and sharing that journey. So I think there's, there's an opportunity to, to reimagine social bonding and what it looks like to share the experience. Um, yeah, so I, I completely agree and I find it, it heartening when I think about, oh, did I form friendships? Yeah, definitely. I don't think the past two years have been lonely because, you know, here we are. When I moved to Oregon from Florida, 3,000 miles away at 51 years old, left everybody and everything I knew and loved and started a brand new career and a brand new life in a place where I knew nobody. But at the end of every day, I could log in and my virtual home was exactly the same. My virtual community was still there. It was almost like my lifeline because those, they stayed stable while the rest of the world was like a snow globe, you know, where the giant would come along <laughs> and I'm floating around in this snow globe. So um, it's yeah. there. It's very real. Those those bonds. It's pretty wonderful. Wow. I I and I've seen people in the chat adding things, and I know you know there are people. Roxanne is one of them adding thoughts in the chat, and we've been together so many times in VR that I I do feel you know our our physical bond for sure. There's also um you know, the mirror neurons and the emotions when we share something meaningful. I think that, again, you know, back to teams, back to um, opportunities for people to to do work in new ways. You know, you can you can build a lot of team trust through metaverse connections for sure. I mentioned the Parkinson support group. Um, we met, she was 84, so six years later, when Fran, the woman who started the group, turned 90. Several of us flew from all around the United States to Southern California to celebrate her 90th birthday with her. And we had never met in the, you know, a couple of us hadn't met individually, but as a group, we had sat together in a living room in Second Life every Thursday morning at 10 o'clock for six years. And it was the first time we sat in a room together as humans. And it was like you could, I mean, it, it was seamless. There was no trying to rearrange, oh, wait, that's you, not the avatar. Mm -hmm. It was, we knew each other so well and we're so comfortable. It was just like having another Thursday event. It was amazing. That's so cool. I'd love to do a study on what would be the length of time because my theory would be that it's, um, conceivably maybe easier for people to form that trust and bond using XR with less time friction because you wouldn't have to have the time to commute, be in social space, all of that. You show up together. And again, I think this kind of well-being, like if, if you're together and you're having some kind of positive experience, some wellness with social, and then you have that collaboration, um, you know, it, I just feel like uh, people have a lot I've, I've witnessed people go deep pretty quickly if they have that trust first and they have that environment first. And those are spaces that we can create in XR. So I think, um, yeah, what you're sharing, it's so powerful. And it's, again, non, 
non-dual. It's like there's there's a yes and to the physical and the virtual. And I love what Roxanne is, um, her point of uh, facial emotion in XR. Um, and and there are people who can't don't understand and can't read facial expressions. People on the spectrum who are love being in a, on a screen because their emotion, everybody's emotion is via text, LOL, you know, or hugs, or, you know, it's, it's, you know what it is, you're not trying to figure it out from somebody's facial expression. So, and I think about how we could train people or help people heal, you know, when you talk about trust or yeah. how they can, and having to do that, I mean, at the center of everything we're doing in, our, in the lab is ethics. So mm -hmm. how do you embed ethics in all of these experiences in a way that we know that people will and have and do use them nefariously? Um, for So for all the good we do, we'll find somebody is going to come along and figure out how to make money from it or catfish or, or, or. <laughs> so, you know, it's how do we build that? those safety features in there that help people function at their highest level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, was this also like on top of that, I, design was mentioned a while ago and I've been wondering like what, what are some rules to like when you create a space, like build that into the design that it encourages comfort and trust and, and all that. So I really love that you're asking that, Donna. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I can pick up on the, the mic over there, and I think it actually comes through OK. Um, good. One, of the, one of the conversations that I had this week for the AWE preview was with Elizabeth Yenyek of uh, WebEx Holograms. And her whole work is about creating lifelike streaming avatars and scenes that are holographic. Um, specifically because she's really focused on WebEx applications and doing work. Right. Uh, I think it's really interesting that Caitlin is also doing like flow and creative work for work and that leverages the totally opposite approach and going into that immersive space. So I'm, I'm still trying to figure out like, is it because of the work and the job that we're trying to get done or is it about how we want to show up and like what we're trying to do personally in those spaces like it really feels like starting at the why right should lead you to those kind of affordances and things that you're, you're looking forward to why and to what effect yep i have so many thoughts i think i think that a coupling of um back to what cammy was sharing coupled with nathan something that occurs to me is that um uh, tools and skills, like um, psychologically, if we can use something, it usually becomes part of us. So it's like I'm writing and I'm writing with a pen, like I'm using the pen um, as much as I, I really love to look at metaverse and how we can be so lost in the doing that we become that embodied joy and wonder and we're not hesitating so much to um, think either to ask permission to share or to self-assess or to feel judged so i think in design um, with specifically with xr you can play around with everything from asynchronous content to people in small groups where everybody has a different role to play you know it's it's i try to look um, from different lenses and to see how how we can increase the ability for people to have that, you know, back to Don Norman, of course, you know, you have the behavioral, the visceral and the reflective design elements. Um, and also maybe a different, a different world building where it's not frame to frame, but it's like world to world. And there's some expansion outward where um, sometimes people are going to be surprised. I don't like designing worlds that have one lit up object because I feel that's, um, diminishing my creative power to, to kind of choose a little bit and have some consequence. Um, so I know I'm being very abstract, but I think there are chances in there to give people a sense of agency that then gives back both a feeling of 
of will and, and what do you actually um, want to do and, and ultimately how can you um, both see past, uh, not, ev not even a sense of self. I think that the, the notion of self can get very big and also very small when you're when you're in worlds and you realize how much you can play around with space and time and dimension. Um, and that's why sometimes people get very quiet when they get in there because it's actually soulful. They, they didn't expect it and they feel like, wow, you're not only holding me in um, a spirit of love and compassion, but like, I, I really want to get to know people. Like they come in and I say, what's your story? And let's, let's express it in different ways. Um, so that's, that's occurring to me more from here than from here as I'm addressing that, that answer. But um, I, I could predict that probably because AI is increasing that um, we're not going to need to learn how to automate as much as we're going to need to learn how to connect and how to, how to do exactly what Donna was saying, have that, that inside me able to be seen and felt by others. And so I think this time for ethical conversations and those difficult spaces, like we could bring that totally into metaverse in a way that changes the future of leadership. And then we start to build a better world in the physical spaces. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. uh, if I can get you to um, mute, I'm yep. going to push this along in our program. Keelan, thank you so I'm much. That was such a fantastic uh, place to wrap up that conversation. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this. As Nathan is muted, I'm going to fill the empty space. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take it back. Uh, you are. You are. I, we're going to, yeah, I super appreciate it. Um, we're going to quickly jump into the XR effect. We're going to do a couple wrap up bits for the event. And then uh, anybody who would like to, we're going to jump back into the moon garden uh, for just a little bit of focus and maybe a little bit of flow there. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, say thank you so much. Actually, let's do it this way. Uh, really quickly, uh, all of you virtually and those of us here, a big round of applause and thank you for Dr. Donna Davis and Caitlin Krause. Uh, such a fantastic conversation today. Awesome. Here we go. We're gonna just crush it as we move along. Um, so, uh, every month at uh, All Night Portland, we uh, present to you a segment called the PDX Effect. This is XR experiences that are made here in Portland that you can experience for yourself. Uh, the first one that we want to call attention to opens today uh, in Pioneer Square. It's also known as Portland's uh, living room. There's both projected uh, XR experiences within a dome and then mobile AR experiences that you can experience throughout uh, the square, which include moments of awe and delight. Uh, this is put together by the Center for, or excuse me, the Creative and Emergent Technology Institute. Uh, you can learn more at SETI. Institute. I'm trying a late in the game handover. Uh, we're going to see if um, we can get them in here to introduce this program themselves. But additionally, oh, and check it out. We are so lucky to have the technology uh, savvy and always online Nisha Burton with us uh, <laughs> to talk about their own uh, XR, their own PDX effect. Uh, Nisha uh, is a designer, a creative director, and has had, oh my gosh, I, uh, way more accomplishments than I had prepared as an introduction. Nisha, thank you so much for joining us. And you've been doing a lot of work around education and teaching people uh, about uh, how to get into uh, XR and how to apply it in their work. Can you tell us a little bit about the Skillshare uh, that you've got going that's up here on the link? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I'm very passionate about bringing creators from various backgrounds into the XR space and into creating using immersive technologies. So this course that I created is 
beginner level, but I think all levels can really get a lot out of it about storytelling using immersive technologies. We all know how, you know, there's the wow factor to being in virtual reality, um, but that can wear off quickly. And so coming from a film background as a filmmaker, really embedding experiences with meaningful stories is so important to continue to move these technologies forward and make people want to really stay and engage with the story. And I think this medium, unlike others, gives that level of interactivity and possibilities with co-creation of story that's so exciting. So yes, this is a course that I have on Skillshare that you can check out. Um, if you click the link, you'll get a free month. So you'll be able to check that out free on Skillshare. And yeah, I really just am excited about continuing to push the conversation forward and see more and more interesting and unique uses of storytelling in immersive technology in the XR space. So that's my quick blurb about that that class. Nisha Burton, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, check her out on Skillshare uh, and with uh, Reflective Brands. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today. Definitely, thank you. Awesome. Oh, I am uh, fighting our I'm fighting our control team. Excellent. So, uh, moving along. As always, we have a community survey uh, that's both available, uh, so bit.ly, uh, all caps, all PDX underscore survey, uh, to help us understand the kind of content, topics, and conversations that you're looking to have. Additionally, we're always looking for volunteers. Uh, so similarly, bit.ly, all PDX underscore volunteer, uh, you can join uh, the illustrious likes of Lindsay and our other volunteer team that helps us uh, run a tip top show here. Awesome. So uh, our next event, uh, we're taking a pause in June uh, because Augmented World Expo is coming soon. Uh, we're doing a lot of work for new AR Minute episodes and we'll be coming back to you with a summertime ex-artist takeover where we're handing the all night agenda to our creative uh, XR makers and doers. Uh, and we hope uh, that you'll join us for that uh, coming soon. Oh my goodness. So with so with no further ado, we have come to the end of this um, of today's all night Portland. I'm oh my goodness. Gonna bring everybody up here for one last thank you so much. We've got <laughs> oh no. We're fighting. Uh, we've got Dr. Donna Davis uh, from the Oregon Reality Lab, part of the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communications. We've got Caitlin Kraus uh, from MindWise. Check out the links for Flow Camp as well as Designing Wonder. And if you are able, please join us uh, when you close these links out uh, back in the Moon Garden uh, for a short wrap up uh, after party and uh, mindful entry into XR. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's such a pleasure. I'm doing a screenshot right now. Thank you. Wow. Joy.